Good evening, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome everyone to Spectrum 360's part of our uh, uh, Spectrum of Options seminar series. Uh, we just completed uh, four sessions on uh, on housing, which we really appreciate the, the you know the, the uh, large participation and the feedback. And this one relates to it. This one is very important. Uh, this one is called securing financial future of your loved ones with special needs. And we're very fortunate uh, to have the speaker, uh, Don Brown here. And again, for those of you that don't uh, know who we are, uh, Spectrum 360's mission is to provide the highest quality educational therapeutic program for children with learning language and social emotional challenges to achieve their maximal potential as responsible as adults in society and to serve as a leader in promoting the following innovative educational programs. Uh, our programs include Academy, Academy 360 Lower School, Academy 360 Upper School, Independence 360 for adults over 21, a Culinary Academy and a Film Academy. And again, our program serves over 400 individuals on the spectrum from the age of three, and I think our oldest in the adult program is over 40 years of age. Um, I just want you to know about the upcoming seminar. We're doing another seminar on November 5th. Please note that date. And it's gonna be on a very important topic, autism, puberty, and sexuality, and behavioral assessment and education. And we have the very well-known speaker, Dr. Frank Cicero speaking. I know this whole issue of puberty and sexuality is very important to a lot of families and Dr. Cicero, we're very fortunate uh, to have him. All right, again, uh, for the tonight's session, please submit all questions in the chat room and then we're allowing a lot of time for presentation for Q&A. Um, all right, at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Donald Brown, a little bit about his background. Um, Donald Brown is a graduate of Rutgers University. He has a degree in economics and finance and has 25 years experience in retirement, estate, and special care planning. Educating individuals and families on how to properly plan for dependent with special needs. This is the primary focus of, of, um, of Don Brown's uh, practice. With, he has a natural ability to energize crowds, make people laugh, and help them solve financial problems using easy to understand ideas and stories. He makes uh, financial topics fun and interesting, and he feels simplicity is the key to getting people in action. He regularly speaks at local support and nonprofit, including a, a monthly educational workshop for expecting parents on the, on, the base, on the basics of financial security. He's been a speaker at, uh, uh, for at Autism New Jersey and Autism Speaks. And I must say, I attended the Shah Housing um, Conference um, last, last year, and I had the, uh, had the opportunity to attend his session. And I must say, it was one of the best sessions I ever atten attended on this topic. So we're really very fortunate, fortunate to have Don. All right, Don, um, welcome, and uh, I turn it over to you. Oh, thank you very much. And uh, both Melissa and Bruce, thank you very much for helping us organize this meeting. I welcome everybody to this meeting. We're happy you're here. Uh, thanks to Dr. Ettinger for introducing me to the Spectrum 360 organization, and thanks to Melissa for help scheduling this. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna give you a couple kind of ground rules for our workshops, particularly since now we've switched from being in person now to everybody sits in front of a computer. So for all of our workshops, we give you three commitments. Here's those three commitments. Number one, we wanna make sure that you're educated. That's why you came. You wanna see what you need to do and if you can learn anything from this workshop. Number two, I want to give you at least one actionable item where when you walk away from this workshop, you can go do it immediately and you can say, thanks, I'm glad I was there. And number three, as Bruce mentioned, we don't want it to be boring. We want it to be entertaining. I don't want to be speaking at you. We certainly like participation, 
So through the chat or questions feedback, please feel free to allow any questions that you have, type them in. Certainly if they're of a personal nature, reach out for me and my organization afterwards, and we'll talk about um, the result of this workshop, the consultations that can take place. So without any further ado, let's get right to the actual workshop itself. You'll notice the name of our organization is called Special Needs Funding Coach. The reason it's Special Needs Funding Coach, because I'd like you to think of what a coach does. When you're learning a sport or you're learning an activity, a coach does three things for you. A coach teaches you the basics. A coach teaches you the fundamentals and the coach knows the rules of the game to help you succeed in winning that game. That is exactly what our role is for our families. We wanna help our families do the right planning and do the things that they should do because we know nobody teaches that and that's our role. So what I want you to do is I want you to sit back. I want you to have a piece of paper and a pencil for any notes and certainly feel free to ask questions along the way. What we're about to do is we're about to go over a 10 step checklist. At the end of our workshop, we'll get email addresses and postal addresses and we'll send you our kits. One of those is the 10 step summary. So you don't have to worry about writing down all 10 steps. What I want you to do is experience those 10 steps, each one of them, and then we'll talk about how to seamlessly put them all together. And again, please don't be afraid to ask questions as we go. And here's the basics, okay? What's important to you as a caregiver? We know that as a caregiver of somebody that has special needs, you're the ones looking out for their best interest. We always say you're the best advocate because you know that person the best, you know that person the most, you care and love for that person, and you wanna do the best for them. But the question always comes, and it's usually probably either first thing in the morning when you're praying for strength, or 2 a.m. when you can't sleep, what's gonna happen when I'm gone? Who's gonna be able to take care of the person that I take care of now, almost subconsciously and unconsciously competent? The things they do in the activities of daily living, the things that they do as they change and grow, the behaviors and supports that you want to be them to have taken care of so they can have a quality of life and a lifetime of care that you would want for them. So let's talk about the steps. Step one is called plan for the future, which is obvious. But what we always tell our families is hope is not a plan. Hoping that things will work out with Medicaid, hoping that things will work out with a group home, hoping that a sibling or another uh, relative will take care of those things. Hope is not a plan. And regardless of what planning you've done so far, regardless of the amount of economic resources you have, planning on whatever level has a significant impact. We'll talk about the times when people do planning, but we reference planning, particularly when it comes to a family with special needs, we reference it like a shade tree. The best time to plant a shade tree is 20 years ago. The earlier, the better you do your planning, the more impact it can have, and the lesser of the evils of doing that planning take place. So. When we talk about your plan, what do we want to talk about? Well, we want to talk about things like medical treatments, behavioral treatments, things that your dependent needs, things that your dependent receives, and things that your dependent depends on for their health, for their mental health, for their quality of life. We want to talk about their education. What happens as they go through school? What happens when they get out of school? Are they going to go to a supported college? Are they gonna to go to a work program? Are they gonna to go to a vocational school? Are they gonna to go to one of the many uh, community college programs now that are available for special needs? Well, planning for those things helps the results and the outcomes always be better. And the last one, of course, I you know this is a uh, passion for Dr. Rettinger and for your organization, and it's housing. Where is my special needs dependent on the living? Are they gonna live with me? Are they gonna live in a supported group home? Are they gonna be able to live independently on their own with some levels of support? We don't know. But I will tell you this, if you're familiar with Camp Fatima of New Jersey, it's an organization that I volunteer for for the last 30 years. And we do summer programs 
and then we do weekend programs for adults with special needs. And the longer I do these programs, the more and more I see special needs adults that are now living with aging parents. Now, that's not necessarily a terrible thing if that's what you want to happen, but you also want to plan for what happens when you are gone. Okay, step two. And this is where I would normally stop our workshop and ask everybody a quiz. But the answer is already on the page, so I'll give you the quiz and the answer right away. What is the most amount of assets that an individual can have in their name and still qualify for government support services, specifically Medicaid? Now, why am I bringing up Medicaid? Those of you that may have an adult with special needs, you're familiar with this. Those of you that have children that are school age, you may not be familiar with this. But after the age of 21, most of the support programs that are delivered through the government are delivered through Medicaid. Why is that an issue? It's an issue because you can only have $2,000 of assets in your name and still qualify for Medicaid. So the first note I want you to be writing down is $2,000. I want you to remember that. The reason I say that is because we want our special needs dependents to be able to grow up and have a quality of life. We also recognize that those individuals sometimes need support systems to have that quality of life. My office and HR are not that bad. So how do we do that? How do we, how do we solve that conundrum where I want my individual to be able to work, I want them to have a quality of life, I want them to be able to feel personal value, but in order to have that, they need the government supports to achieve it whether it's housing supports, whether it's transportation support, whether it's medicine, whether it's uh, uh, equipment, those supports are necessary. So how do you get around having $2,000 of assets in your name and still being able to have that quality of life? The first answer that we teach all our families is what an ABLE account is. Sometime in the future, we'll do a whole workshop on ABLE accounts. But here's what I want you to know if you don't know it. An ABLE account is a tax-free savings plan that allows an individual with a disability that manifested itself before age 26 to accumulate dollars up to $15,000 a year can be put into an ABLE account and still qualify for government support services. Not only that, but in the state of New Jersey, an individual who works is able to put up to $27,000 a year into an ABLE account. Now, later on, we're gonna talk about special needs trust, and we're gonna talk about what they can pay for, and we'll talk about what an ABLE account can pay for, but basically, just about anything that's legal, an ABLE account can pay for. Same thing with a special needs trust, with the exception of two things that we'll get to as we go on. Now, why is this so important? It's critically important to make sure that no one that you know or you as a family leave assets directly to an individual with special needs. Because if you leave assets to them, then they are going to have more than $2,000 in their name. And what I want you to remember is if you're leaving assets to them and they have $2,000 in their name and they're automatically disqualified for their Medicaid, you're not there to solve it. They got those assets because you were gone. And we always teach our families when things like this arise, and you've dealt with them at every level. But when things like this arise, there's only two things that solve it, time and money. And you're not there to oversee it. And the reason we think this is so important and it's the first step for action is we want you to review all your beneficiary designations, whether it's your insurances at work, whether it's your insurance that you purchase individually, whether it's your life insurance portfolio, the combination of the two, or your retirement plans at work. All of those plans, all of those contracts have beneficiaries. And most people fill out a beneficiary, typically a spouse or another adult. But typically on those forms, there's this little box you check. And that little box you check says, all of the children of our marriage automatically become contingent beneficiaries. 
So your first note is to go back to all of your insurances, whether it's through work, whether it's individual, whether it's retirement plans, and make sure that your dependent with special needs is not a direct beneficiary. And if you take a look at the screen, you'll see something that says inheritance. Many times we run into a situation where you have a well-intentioned relative that thinks it would be very nice to be able to leave some funds or assets to your dependent with special needs. They feel like they're doing a kind gesture and they're doing it out of love and they're doing it out of good intent. But the reality is, if more than $2,000 of assets are left to an adult with special needs, then it unfortunately causes more problems than maybe it's worth. And there's ways to get around it that we'll talk about when we do special needs planning. Oh, sorry. There we go. Step three is to have a family meeting. Now, we know that when a family has a special needs child, it's a family gathering that helps raise that special needs child. But when we're discussing what's going to happen when we're gone, a family meeting becomes even more important, making sure that those family members haven't made a special needs dependent beneficiary finding out who will be guardian or who will take care of that person and oversee their life after you're gone. You may hope it's one of their siblings, but one of their siblings may not be willing or able to do that. They may not be able to do it geographically. They may not be able to do it family-wise because of their own families, and they may not be able to do it financially. But having those plans where everybody discusses their concerns and we talk about what those options are, always leads to better outcomes. And when people have a plan in place, the people that will be overseers and guardians are much more apt to be willing to accept that responsibility, knowing that it's been planned for, particularly on a financial basis. Okay, step four is create a team. And because you're here on this workshop, because you're working with Dr. Rettinger and all the professionals like Melissa at Spectrum 360, I already know you're doing this. So congratulations, thanks for being here, and you're already part of that team. But that team also includes people like myself that are financial professionals, teaching people how to make sure that they're doing what they want to accomplish, and then doing it in the best way possible for the best possible outcomes. When we're doing things like wills and trusts, we absolutely need a special needs attorney. This is not the area that you go to the attorney that did your closing or the attorney that may uh, be a family friend. A special needs trust is so critical to be drawn up properly. And the reason is because when you pass away and the Social Security Administration is going to judge whether or not that trust is uh, appropriate and that trust is accurate and correct, it's gonna be a lay person that reads that trust. It's not gonna be an attorney. So if there is anything that's doubtful in a special needs trust because it's done wrong, it gets rejected, which means we go back to the same issue. The only thing that's gonna solve that is time and money to get it fixed. And if they're reading your special needs trust, it means you're not there. And of course, we wanna to talk to the health professionals in your special needs life. The idea is if we put that person in the middle and we surround them, with all of the people that we're talking about, then their quality of life, their outcomes, and the lifetime of care that you hope for them have the best possible plan to do that. And of course, getting additional resource support, you guys are doing that through the school, which is terrific. There are local nonprofits all over. Uh, Autism New Jersey is one of my favorite in New Jersey because I believe they're one of the best organizations that are advocacy, education, and training, and helping to influence lawmakers all at the same time. Get access to those resources. Use your time, technology, and efforts to make sure that meeting people like me, you're able to get resources that you can use directly. At the end of our workshop, if you email us, we're gonna send you a whole kit that includes a special needs planning quiz, an overview brochure, the 10 mistakes that we've seen people make over the years that are the most common mistakes to avoid. 
And when we talk about government agencies, we want to specifically address in this workshop two things. The first one we mentioned already, which is vitally important, which is to make sure that we qualify for Medicaid for adult support services. Once again, I can't emphasize enough, when your special needs dependent turns age 21, now all of the support and resources that were delivered typically through the Department of Education are now delivered through the government support services. Most of those services are typically delivered through Medicaid. Most of us think of Medicaid as health insurance for those people that don't have income or assets. When in actuality, for a special needs dependent, the ARC of New Jersey president said access to Medicaid benefits and access to SSI is the lifeline of support for families with a special needs dependent. So it is critically important that you make sure you're positioning your planning that when your special needs individual becomes an adult, they have immediate access to those services. And those services that are delivered that are not health insurance are commonly delivered through New Jersey what are called Medicaid waiver programs. Things like group homes, things like housing support, things like job support, things like transportation, things like overseeing people living in a group home or an independent setting. All of those support services that are able to lift your quality of life for your special needs dependent are delivered through Medicaid. The other side of that coin is Social Security. Now, you and I are familiar with Social Security for two things. One, of course, for retirement, and two, in the event that we had a long-term disability, we could possibly qualify for Social Security Disability Insurance, SSDI. Social Security Disability Insurance is based on our work record. But what happens if an individual is not going to be able to earn enough income to be able to be independent, to be able to care for themselves and to live independently. SSI is what is designed for them. SSI is supplemental social income, supplemental security income. If an individual is not going to be able to work at the age of 18, you are able to apply for SSI. SSI in the state of New Jersey, for example, is going to pay a little bit south of $800. And the idea of SSI is it's supposed to pay for food and shelter. And we all know in the state of New Jersey, there's no way we can live and eat for $800, other than maybe mom and dad's house. But the idea is that SSI is specifically to be used for that. So if a person has other assets or has a trust that doesn't qualify, then they could lose their SSI. That is the vital importance of making sure that you're coordinating the financial side along with the legal side. Okay, step seven. This is where you can go to workshops many times and there are terrific attorneys throughout the state of New Jersey and throughout the country that I work with that deliver these workshops. Oftentimes they rapidly get very technical and sometimes they lose people because people aren't grasping what they're getting. So for the next couple of minutes, I want to break down estate planning for you so you never forget it, and it's easy. And here's why it's easy. Because the first thing we're going to talk about is a will. Everybody knows what wills are, at least most people do. Most of us know that we ultimately should have one, but many people never get around to it. And the reality is anyone with assets, anyone with a family should absolutely have a will. But those families that have a special needs dependent it is imperative that you have a will. And here's the reason why. If I asked you for a one word definition for a will, if we were live, we'd go around the room and people would give us various one words. Uh, it's a promise, it's a commitment, it's a document. And the word that I want you to write down next to will that you'll never forget is a will is nothing more than a note. And what I mean by that is if you were going away for the weekend and you were leaving us to watch your home or watch your family, you leave us a note. Here's where we are. Here's the neighbor's name. Here's the doctor's name. Here's where the electric box is, et cetera. A will is your note and you're never coming back. So what does a will accomplish? 
The will accomplishes three things that are important for us to remember in our planning. Number one is the easy one. Who gets my stuff? So other than stuff that's owned jointly with a spouse, other than things like life insurance and IRAs that have a named beneficiary, your will is going to determine who gets everything else. The second thing a will does, which is vitally important in special needs planning, is a will determines who will be guardian of our dependents. So if you as a special needs guardian, a special needs parent of a special needs dependent are becoming guardian for that individual when they become an adult, then your will needs to name who's gonna be guardian after you're gone, critically important. And the third piece of a will is who does that for you? That is normally known as the executor or the executrix, the person you name to carry out those things. Now, so what do we remember now? A will is a note, and it's your note, and you're never coming back. In special needs planning, a will goes hand in hand with a trust. Now, many people think, oh, trusts are for rich people. We can talk about trust all day long and the complexities of trust and all the different things that they do. But here's what I want you to remember. If a will is a note, a trust is a bucket. And what do I mean by that? I want you to envision all of the things that you want to leave to your special needs dependent, and I want you to put them in a bucket. And what does a bucket do? A bucket does two things that are important when we're talking about our goals. Number one, a bucket holds things. Number two, a bucket protects things from outside sources, uh, sun, et cetera. In a trust, the bucket, the, the bucket protects from outside sources. What are those outside sources? Those outside sources are the government, so they can't get their hands on that money. Those outside sources are unscrupulous people that would take advantage of our special needs dependent. Those outside sources are people that would decide that they want to have your money in a lawsuit. And this is what I want you to remember. Many families say to us when we first meet, well, we really don't have a lot of assets and we're just going to leave everything to our other uh, neurotypical sibling, our other son or daughter, and we're going to have that money used for our special needs dependent because we know that our son or daughter we take very good care of our special needs dependent. Those are known as gifts of moral obligation. And gifts of moral obligation have too many ways to go awry. What if you pass away, you left those assets to your daughter because you want your daughter to take care of your special needs dependent. But the year after you pass away, your daughter's spouse decides that that's the year they want to have a divorce. Suddenly, the assets that you intended for use for your special needs dependent now become part of a civil litigation that you never intended. That is the critical importance of having a trust because the last thing a bucket does is determines how the stuff comes out of it. If it was water, you can spill it out a little bit at a time. You can turn it over all at once. For our families, a trust allows you to determine what happens to those funds. And it is critically important for our families with a special needs dependent to have something known as a special needs trust. Here's the reason why. Most trusts allow beneficiaries of the trust to use the money for health, education, maintenance, and support, which is terrific. But for a special needs trust, you cannot use those funds for food and shelter. That's what SSI was designed for. So if the trust is written incorrectly, the person will lose their SSI, they'll lose their Medicaid eligibility just because we didn't dot our I's and cross our T's. A special needs trust is not the area to be penny wise and pound foolish. Now, we don't do special needs trust. We get people prepared so when they go to the attorney, they know exactly what's going to happen. They know what they're going to fund their trust with. They know who their trustee is going to be, the person that's going to oversee that trust and those funds. And it makes it easier and a more secure experience for our families to have confidence when they go to get their legal documents done. So 
Let's talk about what the special needs trust can provide for. And if you remember, I mentioned earlier, a special needs trust can provide for just about anything that's legal. If you want funds to take your special needs dependent on vacation and somebody wants to go with them, you can use the trust to do that. If you want to have funds where your son or daughter can add an addition onto their house for your special needs dependent, your special needs trust can do that. Your special needs trust can pay for legal fees. Your special needs trust can pay for anything that's legal other than food and shelter. Those are the restrictions that a special needs trust has. And here's the critical thing that you need to understand. You can put as much as you want in a special needs trust, millions if you like, and your dependent still qualifies for those government support services. Not only that, but if there are assets left in that trust and your special needs dependent passes away, if you're doing what's called a third party trust, meaning you're putting the assets in, then the government never gets it. In an ABLE account, you can accumulate up to $100,000. It's probably not the wisest thing to do, but legally you're allowed to do that. However, if your special needs dependent dies and there's money in an ABLE account, the government gets first crack at what they call clawback, which means they're gonna pay for all the services that they provided you, and they're gonna use the ABLE resources to do that. A third party special needs trust never gets touched by the government. That's why it's so critical to know about it, so critical to use it in your planning and to make sure that you get that planning done correctly with a special needs attorney. We work with lots of special needs attorneys. We're members of the Academy of Special Needs Planners, which is qualified financial people that have a chartered special needs consultant. So they know the financial side and couple it with the legal side for attorneys. That's the way to do successful planning. Okay, there we go. Okay, so we're, we, have whole, we have another whole workshop that we can do on guardianship. So the purpose of this workshop is to let you know that when your special needs dependent comes the age of 18, guardianship is going to become an issue. But we're not going to give you opinions on guardianship. There's opinions all over the spectrum. What we want you to know is A, it's an issue that you'll need to address and make decisions on, and also B, that it's not an all or nothing situation. Guardianship can be on certain levels, whether it's financial, medical, et cetera. It doesn't have to be an all or nothing plenary guardianship. It's designed to make sure that you're protecting your individual with special needs not overseeing them or being restricted. And guardianship also makes sure that somebody is overseeing that person's health care. If you don't have guardianship and your special needs adult gets involved in an illness or an accident that causes them to go to the hospital, many hospitals will say, without a power of attorney or guardianship, we can't share that information with you. They're HIPAA rules. So these are the important things to be informed of when we're making our checklist to make sure we're at least addressing each of those areas. So you come through this workshop, you sit and you say to yourself, I need to do that type of planning. I'm motivated to get it done. And now we know who's going to be our care provider, whether it's professional, whether it's family, whether it's a combination of the two. How do I assure the kind of care for that person that I would give to them myself? How do I make sure that that person takes care of my special needs dependent the way I would want them to? And this is where we're gonna to talk to you if you haven't heard of it or if you have, it's called a letter of intent. And what a letter of intent does is it allows you to plan for your special needs dependent's daily needs when you're no longer there. Special needs dependents have letters of intent. Some of them can be a one page letter. Some of them can be very long and involved with video if somebody's medically uh, involved. We have a special needs letter of intent that we provide to you during our planning process and it's a 38 page document. Now, we're not telling you it's a 38 page document because we want you to be scared of it. We're telling you it's a document 
that covers everything so you don't forget anything. Everything about the things people like for daily living. What is my specialty dependent like? What are they not like? Part of what got me professionally involved in special needs planning is my personal life. I have a cousin, Paulie. Paulie was born with Down syndrome. Now, Paulie's not very verbal, but letter of intent's a perfect example. Paulie loves Coca-Cola, as you can imagine, okay? But if you put a Diet Coke down in front of Paulie, and Paulie took a sip of that and put it down and didn't take any more, and you said to Paulie, Paulie, everything okay? You go, yeah, everything's okay. But he doesn't like diet soda. He likes Coca-Cola. Paulie loves hard rock music. He absolutely loves it. We take Paulie in concerts. He's the best air guitarist you ever saw, and he absolutely loves hard rock music. But if somebody was to be able to take care of Paulie and it wasn't his mom or dad, wouldn't we want them to know that those are the things that Paulie likes? That's what a letter of intent does for you. It makes sure you don't miss anything. Which doctors do you go to? Which places would you never go to again? What are your thoughts on religion? What are your thoughts on dating? What are your thoughts on marriage, et cetera? It's almost like you're handing the person that you're asking to take care of your special needs dependent a playbook. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's how you're going to allow that person to take the best possible care of your special needs dependent. That's why the planning has such an impact because you can do it in a structured way where you're checking things off and you're making sure you're addressing everything that's important to you. So if you say life's been overwhelming, part of the reason that we do what we do is we know that when you're having your dependent with special needs as they grow up, you're battling for everything. You're battling for early intervention. You're battling for IEPs. You're battling for education, resources, support, getting to the proper schools and organizations. So this is an area where we are so fortunate that we can bring information and resources and answers to you where you don't have to battle for them. That's our motivation. We know nobody's taught people how to do this. That's why we do it. So there are two parts of it, as you can imagine. The first part is the financial part. Second part's the legal part. And we want to make sure that we take both of those things into account to make sure that all of those things are working together to have the best possible outcomes <clears throat> for your dependent special needs. Excuse me. So now that we've gone through those 10 steps, we've briefly touched upon each one of them so you can take some notes and write down. Now, how do we help? Here's how we help. Special needs planners like myself, we have them all around the country. I'm the head guy, I work on every case, and we have staff that are experts in every different area that we touch. We're able to introduce you to nonprofit partnerships like Autism New Jersey and other resources. We will introduce you to special needs attorneys that will be the attorneys that you need and that will suit your needs most importantly. And then lastly, if we're talking about having a special needs trust to provide resources, for when I'm no longer there, then we're going to talk about a wide variety of trust funding options. What do you put in a trust? And here's where we can have the most impact. I'm doing this for 30 years, and I'm going to tell you there is no more cost efficient or tax efficient way to fund a special needs trust than with life insurance. Life insurance provides dollars from pennies when it's needed the most, which is when you're gone to fund your special needs trust. And we do two things with life insurance. Number one, we teach you that's what you fund your special needs trust with, whether it's temporary, whether it's whole life, there's something called survivorship life, which provides more money because it's only paying a death benefit when the second of mom and dad passes away, when it's needed most. We also have our trust funding life insurance have living benefits attached to it. It's so, so important you understand that today's life insurance is much different than it used to be, particularly with living benefits. Do me a favor, if you have a pencil, write this down. After our workshop tonight, go to YouTube, 
and I want you to look up a three minute educational cartoon that's called Living Benefits, the Smartphone of Life Insurance. Write that down again, YouTube. Living Benefits, the Smartphone of Life Insurance. In three minutes, you'll get an entertaining education on what living benefits are. But let me explain it to you in two or three sentences where I hope you'll grasp it and it makes sense. Living benefits allow you to today use the death benefit on your life insurance before you die. If you have a critical illness, cancer, heart attack, stroke, if you have a chronic illness where you need long-term care, if you have a terminal illness where you need resources before you pass away, living benefits now allow you to use the death benefit on your life insurance tax-free before you pass away. So many times we meet families and they'll say to us, uh, oh, I've done my special needs planning, I have a trust. And then the next question we'll ask is, oh, terrific. What do you plan on putting in the trust? And most people hesitate and they'll think for a few minutes. And the reality is the answer is typically going to be whatever's left. And the two biggest things that are probably going to be left are a house and whatever's left in our retirement plans. And not that you couldn't put those into trust, but they are probably two of the most inefficient assets that you could put in a special needs trust for a variety of reasons. So what we want to teach you is we don't want you to leave your special needs dependent any money. We want you to leave them life insurance because the money you would leave them can provide a lot more life insurance than a life insurance policy that goes tax free into that trust. So that's where our coordination of special needs planning helps you be efficient in the way that you use your assets. Too many times we see special needs families where in order to provide for their special needs dependent, they sacrifice too much of their own lives, including their retirement. What we teach our families is, regardless of your economic status, proper special needs planning has a huge impact, not only on your security and your well-being, but also the well-being of your special needs dependent long after you're gone. So, in summary, we want you to find quality professionals to assist you. Use those professionals in all areas, like you're doing with Spectrum 360. Use them in the legal area, the financial area, the support area. We know that you are the expert about your dependent. Nobody knows them better than you. That's what makes you their advocate. That's what makes you look out for them. And we wanna teach you how to provide a lifetime of care that goes together with a quality of life. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to look at the screen now and you'll see two websites. The first one is the one I'd like you to go to. It's called specialneedsfundingcoach.com. There you'll find resources that we've referenced. There you'll find the ability to ask us a question or to connect with us and ask us to contact you. I'm also going to give you, uh, and I think Melissa may have provided it to you, uh, my email address is dtbrown at nlgroupmail.com, d-t-b-r-o-w-n at n-l-g-r-o-u-p-m-a-i-l.com. And my direct office number, if you'd like to reach me, is 848-200-7148. That's 848-200-7148. So now, Melissa and Bruce, I'd like to throw it back to you guys, and we can address any questions that people have. Sure. Thank you. Um, if you don't mind uh, stopping this share, and we can start the Q&A. There's been some questions that have come through. First, we want to thank you for your time. And you're right, this has been a very energizing presentation, and not just a talking at us, but talking to us, which has been really nice. Um, and so we appreciate your type of presentation skills. So um, just to, a reminder for everyone who's on this webinar, I will be sending an email follow-up with the websites that were mentioned and shown, um, as well as the uh, YouTube video that, that Don had, show, had also mentioned and, and all the contact information. So you can easily find that in one, one place. Um, so you'll be seeing that either tomorrow or Monday morning first thing. And we'll send, um, we'll send a piece along so you can send it out with those things as well. Great. Okay. Perfect. Um, all right. So I'm going to, so what we are going to start with, 
obviously there was like, there was quite a bit of steps. So the 10 steps was great. I think it was a really simple way, but we had some questions come through um, early on, but I think it's just a good refresher. One of the first questions that came through and that was before even the webinar started um, was really what happens, how would changing from, excuse me, from SSI to SSDI affect Medicaid benefits? Um, I'm not exactly sure of the, the details of the question. So let me address two things that I hope will be helpful. SSI is the social security insurance for an individual that can't make a living for themselves. So if they're unable to earn, I think it's more than $1,200 a month, then they will qualify for SSI. SSI is basically minimum support for food and shelter. SSDI is when somebody has worked enough where their payment would be based on their work record. Now, there are many times where an individual with special needs is able to work as an adult for some time, but maybe that causes them not to be able to work when something happens, or when a life event happens, or when their challenges become too overwhelming. So if that person's SSDI would be more than SSI, then they can qualify for that. In addition, they could still qualify for Medicaid-based benefits, but you have to remember the asset limit. The other thing that I'll add on, which is important to our families, is when our families retire and they're receiving their Social Security retirement payment, their individual with special needs is eligible to receive 50% of that payment. So if 50% of that payment would be more than the SSI number, they would now qualify for that number as well. So that's important to know. In addition, when an individual who's on Social Security like mom and dad pass away, then if they're retired, six months after they pass away, their special needs dependent also qualifies for Medicare. Mm. And the reason that's important is if you qualify for Medicaid and you qualify for Medicare, some of the local attorneys, we, they describe that as the brass ring of benefits. Of course, you're getting the benefits of Medicare, which have better health benefits than Medicaid, and you're getting the benefits of Medicaid, which are so vitally important for the support services to have a level of independence that they want. So I hope that addressed at least a little bit of that. Yeah, and there's, there's so, many, there are so many elements to these things, so I think it, that was helpful. Um, you did mention that Social Security benefits for New Jersey were at about $800 per month. Is that correct? That was one of the questions. It, it's, yeah, it's give or take a few dollars, but I think it's a little bit, a little bit south of 800. And what happens is, and this is a good thing for everybody to remember too, when your individual with special needs turns age 18, they're an adult in the eyes of the law. They're also allowed to apply for SSI if you think they would be eligible. But if you are applying for SSI and that individual is living with you, you need to start charging them rent. Now that may sound silly, and I don't care if you ever charge them rent, but you need to have a rental agreement that you, so, you show Social Security that you are actually charging them rent. Because if you do not do that, Social Security considers that in-kind support and they would reduce your Social Security by a third. So again, if their support dollars and support services on the table, we never want to lose any of them. Okay, and that's because Social Security wants to cool. cover food and housing. That's what the benefits are for, right? Food and yes, ma'am. Food and shelter. Okay, that's a really good good tip for everybody. I'm sure that that many people don't talk about that. Um, and so, as we come up, we're special needs trust. That was a really interesting topic, and I think it, it evoked a lot of questions from the from the audience. Um, sure. So, I think let's start from the beginning with special needs trust. Um, so. Should the parents be the grantors or the settler, the settlers? Who should be the trustee and who should the trust be titled? I think that would be a good starting point yeah. for some of these questions. Those, <laughs> those, those are excellent questions. And uh, the, the thing with a special needs trust is different from an ABLE account in two ways. Number one, an individual can only have one ABLE account. 
So if your special needs dependent wants to have an ABLE account and you want them to have one, the state of New Jersey has one, but you can go to any state and get one. They can only have one. In a special needs trust, there could be limited amounts, limitless amounts of special needs trust. Mom and dad can have one. If the parents are divorced, each of them can have one. Grandma and grandpa could set one up for their, for their granddaughter or grandson. You can have as many as you want. The other thing with a special needs trust is you can put as much as you want in it. But the answer to the question is yes, you as a parent or you as a guardian need to be the grantor for that trust because the assets that go in that trust can never be in the name of that special needs individual. I'll give you a quick example. Many times a special needs individual as a result of an accident or as a result of medical malpractice gets a very large settlement, but they still need the support services that the government's gonna provide. So they have to petition the court to allow them to get what's called a first party special needs trust because the assets were in the name of the individual with special needs. The reason that's important is if that trust has assets left in it when that special needs individual passes away, Medicaid gets first crack at that. We're talking about a third party special needs trust where people other than the special needs dependent are the grantor. You can have a limitless amount of assets in that trust. You'll still always qualify for government services. And when the special needs individual passes away, the assets that are remaining in that trust you decide where they go, whether they go to other family members, whether they go to charities, whether they go to any combination of any individual, you get to decide. We teach our families, jokingly, it's morbid a little bit, but it's a way of controlling your money from your grave. What you want to happen actually happens. So the trustee is a very important role. And again, we could talk about that for a long time. But the simple answer is trustees should be somebody that can professionally and financially manage that trust, do things like tax returns and make sure that they're doing what the trust intends, keeping records on what they're spending out of that trust. So what we teach families is your trustee does not have to be the same person as your guardian. For my family is a perfect example. My sister Patty, who was a special needs educator would be the perfect person to be a guardian for any of my dependents that had special needs. But my sister may not be the best checkbook balancer, for example. <laughs> I may not want to have her have responsibility for taxes and assets and funds and record keeping. I want her to look out for my special needs dependent. So your trustee does not have to be the same person. In addition, you can have the trust, you can have a trustee be a professional trustee, whether it's an attorney that does trustee work, whether it's a bank that has a trust department. I would caution you, however, if you want that professional trustee, you have to make sure you put enough assets in the trust because professional trustees will limit how low they would go in the amount of assets, particularly in a special needs situation. Sometimes families like that, what they call co-trustees, where they can have some professional and some family member that's looking out for that person and the professional handling the tax, tax aspect and record keeping aspect. One of the most important things that we always teach our families is to know who you want your trustee to be. Typically it's mom and dad until they pass away and then who's gonna happen be trustee afterwards and then who's going to be successor trustees. You can set all of those things up and if you need to change them, you are allowed to go back and change them if you need. Okay. Um, one good question came up. I mean, you mentioned in life insurance policies and pretty much all of your insurance policies is to ensure that your, uh, your child who is special needs isn't the beneficiary. Um, however, one of the questions that came through is um, how do, can you transfer an existing life insurance policy from an existing regular trust to a special needs trust? Is that something yes. that you can do? Well, that, that, depends on, that depends on the trust itself, and it depends on how the policy was issued. If the policy was issued where the trust is the owner, and that trust is an irrevocable trust, then you have, to, you have some legal work to do to, to kind of unravel that. If the 
the policy has a trust as beneficiary, meaning the trust doesn't own the policy, but the trust is the ultimate beneficiary of the policy. You as a, uh, an insured or a policy owner get to name your beneficiaries and you can change them. So if it's changing it from a regular family trust to a special needs trust for beneficiary, that's not difficult to do. If it's a trust that owns a life insurance policy and that trust is an irrevocable trust, then it takes a little bit more work and probably some legal expenses. Okay, good to know. Um, well, another question came up is you mentioned the with SSI charging family, having families make sure they have a rental agreement of some sort. Um, but does charging your special needs family member rent cause taxable income to go to the parents? Does that have any ta taxable ramifications for the family members outside of yeah, that? And, and that's a, that's a, that's a, uh, an accountant question. Okay. But I understand what you're saying. We're collecting rent. Rent is revenue. And we have to add that to our tax return. Yeah. So if we're talking about $800 a month rent, that's not going to be a huge number that would go on the tax return. And the loss of benefits that a person would be receiving would be greater than any tax that they would have got charged on that. And when you think about it, if you're special needs dependent, uh, the stage you're dependent, even when they're an adult, if you become their guardian, you're going to have more than enough write-offs in expenses for special needs stuff that it'll offset any tax increase from the rent. Okay. Well, along that line, we had two, some two good questions. One was about, so say someone's already receiving social security benefit payments, but they're getting it reduced because they live, their in-kind payment is what you referenced, the in-kind. Yes. What do they need or who do they need to do and what do they need to do to contact to get that maximum benefit from the SSI? That's an excellent question and it's one that happens very commonly. Social security is not going to tell you, hey, you should have a rental agreement. They're just going to reduce your payment for in-kind support. So you simply call Social Security, you get a phone appointment. Unfortunately, in these days, it's going to take a long time. But you'll have a phone appointment and you explain to them that you have an adult with special needs that's living with you and you are now charging them rent. How do you get the rental agreement to them? And you should typically be able to either email it or mail it to them. And that should be able to adjust that in-kind support upward for you because you're now charging them rent and the social security insurance should increase. And then another question to that. So what's the process if the disabled child is nonverbal or severely disabled? How does a rental agreement work? Or how can you make that um, happen between for your child and you? That's an, that's an excellent question. And the idea is if you're guardian for that child or you have financial power of attorney for that child, you're simply able to execute that. You're making those financial decisions for them. So there are a lot of things that our parents and families realize get complicated. When it comes to SSI, you don't have to stress over it that much. You just have to know what to do, then execute it properly, and you should be okay. Okay. So one person had an interesting uh, experience and is looking for some advice. They, they were told by the Social Security office that as a guardian, they need to disclose the balance of any ABLE and special needs trust. Um, can, can this info being shared with a Social Security agent used to determine <clears throat> child's monthly SSI payments? Uh, the money that's in an ABLE account and the money that's in a special needs trust, particularly a third party special needs trust, will not impact SSI. But the reason SSI is asking you that is if somebody uses the ABLE account as their primary resource for accumulating funds for their special needs dependent, if the balance in that account goes over $100,000, then that negatively impacts their SSI. Hmm. In the practical world, Melissa, there is no reason anyone should ever accumulate $100,000 in an ABLE account. The money that goes in an ABLE account should be the first money that you use for your special needs dependent in any year. Okay, good to know. Um, we've had some feedback from people who've had experiences saying that they've talked to some social security agents um, and said in order to charge a child rent, it would have to be at market rate, which would be so high for some areas in New Jersey, it would exhaust all their benefits. Do you have any suggestions or, or yeah. ways to work around that? 
in, what they're saying to you is in legal terms, you have to charge your special needs individual what you would charge somebody off the street, the market rate. And all you simply do is you look up one bedroom rentals in your town and you know what the market rate is. And all of us know that the market rate's typically gonna be over $800 anyway. So if you're charging them the market rate and they're still getting the full SSI, that's all, S that's all Social Security needs to know. Okay, so it shouldn't deter people or scare them because the money is going to be exceeding it. It's just recognizing that the money is going towards it as a payment, not all of it. It shouldn't, don't worry about it being equal. Is that kind of what you're saying? Correct. If, okay. if what you're charging is market rate and market rate in your town is $1,000 a month. So you show them a rental agreement that you're charging $1,000 a month, then that's not going to impact their SSI. Yeah, so the 800, if say that they get $816, they're, right. that's going to, and 190 or $84 is going from somewhere else. Got it. Right. Okay, that's a really good, I think that some people probably, we, I would be scared because it's just not equal. So that's a really right. good. And, and I understand, we've been on calls with families with Social Security when a parent dies, et cetera. And they're not going to be filled with forthcoming information. They're just going to read you the rules. Mm. Of when they say you have to charge market rate, don't be scared of that. Market rate's market rate. Yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah, especially in New Jersey, <laughs> we're yeah. all there is no market rate like that. Um, so, can, you know, we've talked about able accounts and we talked about special needs trusts. Can someone have both of those at the same time? Not only can they have it, in most cases, Melissa, they probably should have both. Okay. And, Special needs, when the ABLE account first got approved in the year 2014, many special needs attorneys were afraid that their practices were going to go away. But the reality is you can only put $15,000 a year in it and you could only max out at $100,000. So if you're talking about a lifetime of care for your dependent with special needs after you're gone, you know $100,000 isn't going to last very long. Right. So in most cases, with rare exceptions, you should probably do both. And one of the loopholes that you could take advantage of, and we like loopholes when they're legal, and we like loopholes when the loophole has a positive outcome for us. One of the loopholes is you can take money out of a special needs trust every year, and you could put it into an ABLE account. And an ABLE account is able to pay for housing, where a special needs trust cannot. Okay. Um, so another, since you're talking, we're talking about ABLE accounts, can an UTMA and a 529 account be converted to an ABLE account? Uh, 529 accounts, definitely. UGMA, uh, I think there are limits. I'm not certain what they are, but I think they can be converted. But many times as you're converting them, you're paying tax on the gain before they get converted. The answer is 529 plan, definitely yes. UGMA account, yes, but with different parameters. Okay. Um, back to kind of the SSI question. So should, should you open a joint bank account with your special needs adult named child um, for SSI direct deposit when you first apply for SSI or wait until they're approved for SSI to open that account? You, you wait until they're approved because typically if they're approved, you would probably be listed as what's called representative pay, which means they know that that individual is not going to be able to handle money on their own. You're going to be a guardian for them, or even if you're not guardian, your representative pay for their funds, then you would have a joint account. You would have the monies deposited in that account, and then you would use that account for any expenses that you're going to spend, rent or otherwise, rent, able account, special needs, trust, et cetera. Okay, right. and then what would, what would be the typical cost to open a special needs trust? Is there any minimum or what, what is the way to do that? Those are great questions also. And what we try to do is we try to guide families to the attorneys that are going to suit their needs. Some attorneys have been doing it so long that you're not going to get to see them unless you're willing to pay $4,000 to do your will and your trusts. Other attorneys will do the whole kit and caboodle for $2,500 or $2,000, depending on the complexities of the trust and the needs of the family. So certainly what we do is when we refer somebody to a special needs attorney, 
they were able to have a introductory conversation with that attorney to find out if they're comfortable with that attorney, to find out if that attorney suits their needs. That attorney will then in turn tell them what they're going to pay if they hire them, and they will send them what's called a letter of engagement. And the letter of engagement says, you should be doing this, 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 and this, in order for us to execute those documents for you, our cost would be X. And if you want to engage them, you sign the letter and send it back with whatever your deposit requirement is, and you can engage them. Um, it will, in those attorneys, especially the attorney, would they be helpful in, you know, drafting up a rental agreement or creating the letter of intent um, for, you know, just kind of give, giving a be in one stop shop because there seemed there was a lot of things that seemed to have a lawyer's uh, yeah. eye should be on there just to kind of help protect the those who are doing this and also the, the children. Sure. Most qualified special needs attorneys will have a letter of intent document. As I mentioned, we have a letter of intent document that we use in the planning. The letter of intent document is not a legal document. Hmm. However, it has stood up in court when there have been family disputes and a special needs trust was already in place and the legal documents were already there. So it's kind of like the thing that's supporting the legal document. Here's what we're doing for our special needs dependent. Here's the assets or insurance that we're putting in the special needs trust. And the person who's going to look out for our individual, the guardian, and the trustee who's going to oversee the monies has a letter of intent so they know what it's to be used for and how to best care for that individual. Mm. Really One of the things I'll bring up that some people aren't aware of is there are nonprofits in every state that run what's known as a pooled trust. And a pooled trust is for a family that either can't afford to do a trust on their own, don't want to do a trust, or there are very limited assets that would be going into the trust. But what a pooled trust does is it qualifies for a special needs trust, so your dependent could still have support services. Every individual has their own account in the special needs trust, so the money you put in a pooled trust gets to be used for your dependent. The two issues with this pooled trust that you need to investigate very carefully are number one, what are the trust fees? Because sometimes the fees are ongoing and they can be higher than if you had your own trust. And number two, they also have provisions where if you die, where the special needs dependent dies and there's money still left in their account, many times that nonprofit pooled trust gets a high percentage of those assets. So, most often, most attorneys and most professionals like myself would always highly recommend getting your own individual trust. But short of that, there are pooled trusts that are in every state. That's good to know. That's a good option. In New Jersey, it's called New Jersey Plan. It's an plan. organization that runs the pooled trust. And they're also able to have life care plans executed where if, a, if parents don't have a successor guardian, they can actually take over as guardian, even if you have your own special needs trust. Mm. Okay, that's great to know. So as we're coming off the heels of the housing webinar, I think this is a good question that can just help guide some people who have been attending since the beginning of September. So how can we fund, the question is, how can we fund a group residence for a 21 year old if we can't use the trust? They're older and we don't want to wait 10 to 12 years for housing on the DDD waiting list. And we've been researching places that are great services, but would have a budget that's too small to pay for the residents. The residents. Right. How do people pay for these arrangements? And I, th those are great questions. And as we're dealing with it, it is one of the biggest challenges that the special needs community faces right now in the United States because of those limitations and those challenges. So I'll answer your question directly. And then I'll give you some uh, references that I'd like you to go look at after you get off our webinar. Uh, number one, if a group of families or parents want to purchase their own group home, they want to collectively get together, let's say, put their assets together and purchase a group home, they can do that. They don't need to have the money come from a special needs trust to do that. They can do that on their own. The special needs trust could own the home, you have to have a lot of provisions in your trust to make sure you're doing it right, though. 
how's the home going to be upkept, who's going to pay the taxes, etc. Uh, or the special needs trust could be owned by a separate uh, LLC, uh, S corporation, nonprofit that the family set up where monies now go to pay for that home and SSI is not, uh, is not taken away, Medicaid supports aren't taken away, and the special needs trust still has the opportunity of paying for all those other things other than housing. And remember, if you're transferring money from a special needs trust to an ABLE account, because living in the group home is going to cost more than the $800 a month that Social Security costs, you can still use money from the ABLE account each year to help pay for those housing expenses as well. Okay, great. Um, and so going back to housing, so another good question is, since leaving your house is inefficient for the it doesn't work for the trust. How do you leave your house for the, your special needs child? How do you kind of do that? That's a, that, it's a great question. And every once, every individual situation is different. Uh, in general, if your plan is I'm leaving my house. So my special needs dependent can live where they're comfortable, where they're used to, where they'll have the best quality of life, then your planning needs to take advantage or plan for details. Those details are, if I'm putting the house in the special needs trust, who's gonna pay the expenses for the house? How do they get paid? Does that house qualify as a Medicaid approved facility? And if it doesn't, doesn't keep you from getting Medicaid from other sources or for other things, but it's not going to be a Medicaid approved facility where it's a group home. And you also have to be careful because there are a limited amount of insurance companies that will insure a home for property and casualty if it's owned by a trust. So whether it's selling the home and using the proceeds in the trust to help support uh, a quality of life in another home, whether it's a group home, whether it's independent living, et cetera, certainly that's possible. Is it possible to put a home in a special needs trust? Yes, you just have to make sure that you let the attorney know that that is your intention so that trust can be set up properly to execute all the details that you would need for home ownership. Okay. So more questions about the trust. So are there different types of uh, special needs trusts? I know you mentioned the one that's the pooled trust, but is there anything else that is any other kind? No, it, and, and typically, you can title a special needs trust anything you want. You can call it your family trust. You can call it the special needs individual's name, special or supplemental needs trust. The title is less important than the actual wording of the trust. And the wording of the trust, without getting into a lot of legalese, has two important factors. One, it's not going to pay for basic food and shelter. And two, it's not going to pay for it. And the wording is typically any type of benefit that would be available to the special needs dependent through government support services. Two general areas of those wordings are what determine a special needs trust. Now, beyond that, you may have as many specific things in that trust as you would like to have as far as how you would like the money spent where you would like that special needs individual to be able to go, who could travel with them. If again, you want one of your family members to be able to build an addition on their home so they can keep that individual in their home and still have their own home and a quality of life, special needs trust can provide those assets to do that. So the wording of the trust is basically to make sure that you work with a qualified special needs attorney. You're gonna be, members of the National Association of Elder Law Attorneys. They're going to be members of the Academy of Special Needs Planners. Um, and you simply would interview any attorney that you spoke to and simply ask them, have you done special needs planning? How many trusts have you done? Are there certain things that you recommend or don't recommend? What are the most common mistakes you've seen people make? And getting a feel for the attorney's answers to those things will really probably give you a comfort level to the one that you choose. 
one question was, when can we start funding the special needs trust? We already have done, have it done. Is it true that it can be funded only when parents die? That's a, okay. <clears throat> the answer is no, you can fund the trust while you're alive. And the idea with a special needs trust is to set up that trust and fund it as necessary. What do I mean by that? To set up the trust and in our organization and in most attorneys, they have a very, how can I say this? A very nicely drafted letter that you can send to family members or friends, anyone you think that would be thinking of your special needs dependent for an inheritance. And simply guide them to say, please don't make the special needs dependent the inheritance, please make the special needs trust the beneficiary or the donor for the inheritance. And that allows you to be able to get that trust funded from many different sources if that's what you chose to do. One of the things that generally happens is the trust will typically be funded after mom and dad pass away because that's when the money is going to be needed most. Typically is, and, and again, every situation is different, but in a typical situation, as long as mom and dad are around, they're typically looking to support their special needs dependent and help them live. It's when they're gone that assets are going to be needed for the next person that you're asking to take care of that person. So certainly you could fund a special needs trust before you pass away, but most special needs trusts are irrevocable, which means you couldn't take money back out of the trust once you put it in. And the other thing to remember is a trust like a human being has a social security number. However, a human being when they work are in different tax brackets based on their income and their write-offs. A special needs trust, once it gets over $1,300 of income, dividends, or growth in a given year, it's automatically in the highest tax bracket of 38%. So how you fund your trust, when you fund your trust is an individual answer it can be done both ways, but the most efficient way is typically when you're planning to fund your trust, if you're able to qualify for life insurance or annuity friendly, trust friendly annuities, then you would use those monies to go into the trust when you pass away. You mentioned reaching out to family members, anyone to, to put money into the trust. So I have an interesting question. If you have um, a, a family who a father or mother is providing child support to the other parent, um, what will happen if they, and they're supposed to be paying through the time that the, the other partner dies, will this have any effect on the funds that they've received after they graduate? And do you recommend them talking to the other partner and just saying, funding it through the special needs fund? Like what is your suggestion in that situation with that? Again, every, every situation is different. So there isn't any broad brush one, one answer for that. But certainly um, if child support is going to continue beyond the age of 18, you want to make sure that you deal with that both as loving parents of the special needs dependent and legally as well. So many times we would encourage that money going into an ABLE account or into a special needs trust. Okay. Also, many times, even though mom and dad may be divorced, they're still on the same page when caring for their special needs dependent. So they may get what's called a second to die policy, which basically ensures two people, but only pays a death benefit when the second of those two people pass away. The reason it was so useful for special needs is it buys a lot more insurance than if you're just insuring that one individual because it's only going to pay a death benefit when the second of them pass away. So the most recent one we did, for example, is we did a million dollar second to die policy for a family and the premium for that policy was about $5,000 a year. So if you can use $5,000 a year and that $5,000 is going to generate a million dollars of tax free assets, for your special needs trust, that is the way to leverage your assets. It's a good suggestion. A lot of options out there. A lot to talk through. <laughs> um, so a couple other questions. We have a few ABLE account, but I, I think one of the ones is, you know, obviously having a trustee, 
and a guardian, what are, which require annual, annual reporting, ABLE accounts, third party special needs trust, first party special needs trust. So they're afraid mm -hmm. that no one's going to be willing to accept this being a trustee with how many things that are going uh, on. And that, and that's, of, part, like, yeah, that's part of the reason whether you use co-trustees or a professional trustee, then you can take that responsibility away from someone. Uh, yes, the trust does have to file a tax return if it has assets in it. Yes, you need to keep track of where those monies are spent should Social Security want to see a review of those things. And same thing with the ABLE account. The ABLE accounts are a lot easier because it's a lot more liberal on what you can use them for. And many ABLE accounts come with a debit card. So when you're using the debit card, you're automatically keeping a record of where those funds are getting spent. Okay. Um, and then another question was, does the disabled person could, um, I'm sorry, I could, I'm going to skip that one. Um, if the special needs person is institutionalized, how does that affect the trust and the ABLE account? Okay. Does it affect the trust? Does it affect the ABLE account? Those monies could still be used for legal expenses on, on the quality of life. If that individual is institutionalized or they are in a group home, Yes, their food and shelter is taken care of, but the things that you may want for their quality of life, whether it's gaming things, whether it's computers, whether it's travel stuff, whether it's clothing, all of those things that you would want that special needs individual to have access to, the trust and the ABLE account still function and accomplish those things. The only thing that happens is when a person is, in, uh, is institutionalized, Typically, the SSI is going to go directly to the institution. Okay. So we're, we're coming up to the end of getting close to it. So I think there, there's some good questions to kind of end it. And it's more of like, so after hearing this, what if you don't have a support group or guardianship in place? What, what would you recommend? What do you do? What's the first step that you would take? Well, if you don't have a guardian in place and your, your goal is to be guardian for your adult with special needs, then it's, it's a personal decision. If you are in a situation where you just don't have anyone, you don't know, we don't have another family member, we don't have a family friend, cousin, et cetera, then that's when you would go to have a professional guardian. And in New Jersey, uh, New Jersey plans probably one of the best organizations for that. Okay. And that's the same, that was the also pooled trust, right? The New well, Jersey you don't have to use a pooled trust to have Plan New Jersey be a guardian, okay. an overseer, but you can use their pooled trust if you want to. They are very happy to be guardian for families that have their own special needs trust because they typically know there's going to be more resources to be able to help that person with special needs. Great. Okay, that's a, I'm glad that there's a resource available for families who need it. Um, okay, so we have a child who's 15. Um, what can we do if we want to start saving money now for this child, um, but want him to qualify, him or her to qualify for Medicaid at 18? So what is your, what is your recommendation? Well, the easiest way is number one, to uh, begin an ABLE account. So when you have monies that you want to begin to accumulate uh, for their use as an adult, you can put up to $15,000 a year into an ABLE account. Secondly, as we talked about with the shade tree, the earlier you plan, the more impact and better your results are gonna be, and the less it's gonna cost you. Mm -hmm. If you have a 15 year old and you say, we wanna start funding a special needs trust, then what better way to do that than to buy the life insurance now when you're younger knowing that when you're older, the life insurance will be paid. It can have living benefits on it for you while you're living if you need them. And you're going to be able to buy a much larger dollar amount that would go into the trust for the resources for your special needs dependent. Okay. So I like to you know, end these web the webinars with just one piece of sage advice that you can give our audience as we are navigating all these challenging times and trying to figure this all out. I would love to hear from you, Don. Something, some advice that you can give our audience tonight. <laughs> uh, I, I guess the biggest advice I can give that I tell every special needs family that we meet is don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of oh, it seems too complicated, or it's too scary, or I don't know how to sort through that information. 
and it paralyzes you where you don't do anything. But if find somebody like me that can walk you through it. If you don't like me, find somebody else that is, is, is knowledgeable in that area. But the more help you get, the more secure you'll be. If you have this planning in place, I'll tell you three things. The times that we work with families most are one, when a child is young, and a family gets introduced to a workshop like this and realizes the impact that they can have the earlier they plan. The second biggest time, however, is when special needs dependents are in that transition phase, which is age 15 to age 21, because families now realize, hey, we need to do some long range planning and we probably haven't gotten to it yet. And many times it's the first time they're starting to realize about adult benefits in Medicaid and lack of assets being in that special needs dependent's name. And sadly, the third most common time is when we meet families that mom and dad are retiring and they haven't done any formal planning yet. Now, each one of those areas, we can have a significant impact and have a quality of life for the special needs individual, but more importantly, or equally as important, to have a sense of security and peace of mind for mom and dad and the family knowing that they have things in place. That's great. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Well, I think we're at time. Um, I want to thank you, Don, for your time and your participation. This was a really engaging webinar, and I know we had mm -hmm. quite a bit of questions. And we, and if there's any others, I'll get them over to you. But thank you. And we, sure. uh, for the audience, we hope to have Don back in the future to maybe do another workshop. So we will let everyone know. Sure. Um, and, sign up for the Center of Options. Melissa, okay. anybody? Anyone who attended this workshop, we will give them a 20 minute, whether it's phone conference or Zoom meeting, et cetera, to answer any of their personal questions or to see if working with us would have a positive impact for them. The only thing we ask is to please, please, please schedule that consultation within the next two weeks. Even if that consultation's for January, schedule within the next two weeks. We do one of these workshops typically every week or every two weeks. So out of respect to all of our other attendees, and this is a particularly busy time for us, we typically want to ask you to schedule that consultation while things are fresh in your mind. Okay. And would you recommend them just emailing you or giving your office a call? What is the best way to get? Any way that's convenient for them. Call my office, email me, contact me through the Special Needs Funding Coach website, uh, through uh, the school. Whatever way is easiest for the family, we'll try to work with them on whatever level that they need. Okay, great. I'll share that information with those who attended and also those who registered because we have some who are going to be watching this video after. So, well, thank you. And I see Bruce, you popped back on. So Bruce, do you want to have any final words before we sign off for the evening? Yeah, I just want to thank Don for uh, the excellent uh, presentation. You're so knowledgeable and we really appreciate it. It's obvious it's more than a job, your caring and your passion. Um, appreciate it. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, You're everyone. Well. Have a wonderful night, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.